Thank you. Good morning. Um, welcome to an inquiry into the workplace drug testing in Victoria. I declare open as the Council Legal and Social Issue Committee's public hearing for an inquiry into the workplace drug testing in Victoria. Please ensure your mobile phone uh, have been switched to silence and that background noise is minimised. Before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional that we gather today and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. And in particular, to welcome any elders or community members who have, who are here in part their knowledge to this issue to the committee. Um, I'd like to welcome our first witness, Mr. Robert Taylor uh, from the Alcohol and Drug Foundation. Welcome, Robert. Thank you much for your time. Yeah. Um, just before we continue, I just want to introduce the um, committee to you. Um, my name is Chung Lu, I'm the chair of the committee. Um, my deputy chair is Mr. Ryan Batchelor, uh, Ms. Rachel Payne, Hi, Robert. Mr. David Ickenshank, and Dr. Sarah uh, Mansfield. Uh, on Zoom, I believe we also have Ms. I mean, Dr. Renee Heath and Mr. Lee Tamales on Zoom. Again, I said thank you so much for coming in and, uh, and have your submission and uh, be a present with this um, panel. Regarding the evidence you're giving to us today, I'd just like to read this to you. Um, all evidence taken is protected by a parliamentary privilege as provided by the Constitutional Act 1975 and further subject to the provision of the Legislative Council standing orders. Therefore, the information you provide during this hearing is protected by law. You're protected against any action for what you say during this hearing, but if you go elsewhere and repeat the same thing, those comments may not be protected by this privilege. Any deliberate false evidence or misleading of the committee may be considered contempt of parliament. All evidence is being recorded. You'll be provided a proof version of the transcript following the hearing. The transcript will be ultimately made public and posted to the committee website. Um, just for hands on record, could you please state your full name and organisation you're appearing on behalf, please? Yes, I'm Robert Taylor. I'm the Policy and Engagement Manager at the Alcohol and Drug Foundation. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Rob. Thank you for your submissions. Um, before I open to the panel for ask questions, I'd like to open, invite you to hand an opening statement. Um, please feel free. Sure, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Committee, for inviting us today and, and for this inquiry. It's an important topic and we're very happy to contribute. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I will say up front, as we note in our submission, we're not experts on workplace law, um, so that's um, something we won't be able to talk to with great detail, but um, I suppose we're here representing the perspectives of the evidence base within the drug and alcohol sector, and particularly the importance of a health-based response to personal drug use, including prescribed medications. Um, so I'll talk to a couple of points just in terms of framing, um, and then happy to take questions and respond to the best of my abilities. So as the committee heard yesterday, uh, this is a very complex issue, um, but fundamentally alcohol and other drug use should be treated as a health issue. It is a health issue and should be treated as such. And we see the poor outcomes that result from punitive and criminalised approaches to drug use throughout the community. We also acknowledge the need for employers and employees to create safe workplaces, particularly where high risk tasks or roles are being undertaken. But we know that uh, approaching um, alcohol and other drug use prescribed or unprescribed from a punitive, stigmatising and often criminalised perspective can exacerbate harm. There are a variety of prescribed medications that can affect someone's performance in a workplace that are not generally tested for currently. Careful thought therefore needs to go into designing an approach to workplace law that is not discriminatory against people who prescribe medicinal cannabis. We know that individuals who test positive for medicinal cannabis may not be impaired, while there are other impairing prescribed medications that are not tested for and plenty of other impairing um, factors like fatigue, um, distraction, etc., that aren't being tested for either. So, what we're really keen to see is a consistent approach to impairment across the board and one that's not based on stigma towards particular substances. A regulatory approach that balances the requirements for a safe, safe workplace with an individual rights to use prescribed medications for health conditions that are required for all possible medications. We'd also like to draw attention to the effects of stigma. Um, this is a really big concern for the Alcohol and Drug Foundation. We know that stigma has a really serious effect on individuals' health outcomes. Um, it uh, can affect someone's willingness to seek support when needed. It can uh, influence someone's willingness to disclose um, whether they're experiencing a health condition. We know the stigma towards mental health conditions, stigma towards the use of particular medications. Um, topical here, obviously, medicinal cannabis, but others too, like um, psychiatric medications, antidepressants, and so on. 
and that stigma can prevent the open and honest conversations that we would feel are necessary to support safe uh, workplaces. So it's really important that through this process, uh, privacy, confidentiality, um, and the dignity of um, individual employees is uh, front of mind. If there are any um, procedures that involve employees disclosing their medications, that um, privacy is, is really up there. And finally, that workplace drug testing, when it does occur, should occur within a broader health-based approach to, within the workplace. So this includes appropriate evidence-based, non-stigmatising education for staff and employers about the effects of different substances and how these might affect an individual. Empowering people with information can help them make better decisions, which can prevent risky use of alcohol and other drugs. Creating a safe environment, creating um, a non-stigmatising environment will do a lot to prevent harm from occurring. To this end, uh, as an example, the ADF has collaborated with stakeholders in industry, including Hope Assistance Local Tradies, who are a suicide prevention group for um, people in trades, to develop a website called Trade Facts. And this is a website that has evidence-based information uh, specifically co-designed with this group. Um, and that's been promoted by Holt at TAFEs to, to up and coming um, tradespeople and on work sites around the state like the Westgate Tunnel and others. So, that's an example from our perspective of what a health-based approach looks like, um, that whatever does come out of this inquiry should um, yeah, include a holistic uh, look at how to create safe and healthy workplaces and prevent and minimise harm, not just uh, try and act after harm has occurred. Um, I'm quite happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Rob. Thanks for the um, brief outline. Um, I'll quickly open up and then we'll open to the committee for questions. Um, just feel free. I just I know you, you mentioned in relation to uh, medicinal uh, cannabis uh, for treatment and for people do use that. Now, I just wanted from your um, understanding of the medicinal cannabis itself, lesson to we heard so far there, there are compounds within the medicinal, medicinal yep. cannabis. Um, there are the CBD, which is the um, uh, camera oil, and also the tetrahydrocannabinol, oils, which has the THC. Uh, I just want from ADF perspective, listen to um, percentage of THC in the medicinal uh, um, medicines, um, and what 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 is allowed, what is not allowed, and what is um, recommended, or what is uh, okay for the uh, person to prescribe on? Uh, I would, sorry, probably not be able to give you a strong answer in terms of uh, specifics around um, percentages within an individual compound, um, within an individual kind of prescription or, or medicinal product. I think that's a little bit outside our expertise. I think that falls into a bit more of a scientific or biomedical space. But I guess in, in broad terms, as I'm sure you've heard, we understand that THC is generally understood to be the more impairing um, of the psychoactive compounds or the most kind of commonly understood to be impairing within the um, uh, kind of spectrum of compounds within cannabis. And that CBD generally is understood to not have a particularly strong psychoactive effect, if any. Yep, that's what I've been we heard so far. In the same. Um, so, and and also we also heard that they can uh, people have been using safely using CBD um, with I think less than two percent of THC or or, or new at all. Uh, we heard from yesterday. Um, so I was wondering, do the ADF support that or ADF? Um, what's the position of ADF uh, having CBD um, with minimised? Um, percentage of THC or it doesn't doesn't really stand in either way? I think we'd on that defer to the TGA who have done the kind of scheduling work around the medicinal cannabis substances, yep. who uh, I believe, if I'm getting it right, c those CBD products that are less than 2% are Schedule 3 rather than Schedule 4, if I'm yep. getting that right. So And yeah. and we do, so would, it, would the ADF support, sometimes people buy, um, over the counter, which has high THC, would they still support that as well or not? Um, in terms of being used in the workplace? Yes, yes. but that's what we, we, we inquire here. Sure. Um, back regulation, we can, we're not looking into that, but by the workplace. Yeah, look, I think ultimately it is going to depend on the individual role, the individual um, person and um, their specific circumstance. And that's why we're kind of advocating for a health-based response within the workplace, um, that it's holistic, that it uh, is, ideally open, confidential, um, 
and there is an opportunity for employers and employees to have conversations about safety. So I have, it's open for dependent on, on, on a condition in a workplace? Uh, yeah, look, it would, I couldn't give a firm answer either way, just given the, the huge range of variability that could come up. Thank you. Um, that's all I have. Um, Deputy Chair. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Mr. Howell, thanks so much for coming in. One of the um, things that's come up, partic particularly, uh, we had a day of evidence yesterday. One of the matters that came up quite a lot was one of the consequences of the, um, and your submission uh, describes it in more sophisticated and scientific terms, but forgive me, the lingering effects of. THC in the system, basically, mm. that it remains detectable for a longer period of time, means that um, some, we had evidence that some people are, to avoid the, the, the consequences of, of detection from workplace drug testing, um, more inclined to use other drugs, so whether they're opioid based or amphetamine, methamphetamine or the like. From a sort of harm and harm minimisation addiction perspective, do you think that's the right kind of settings, or is? Or I think that's a good question. Thank you. It um, and it speaks to what we see often when we see punitive or criminalised approaches to um, substance use in the community. This is something that we see quite often: is that uh, when the punitive approach is taken, people engage in behaviours to try and avoid. Um, those punitive responses and often those behaviours can be as a result more harmful. Um, so in the case you're describing, someone wants to avoid THC detection and uses a drug that might be shorter acting but might have other consequences um, for that individual, uh, may be more harmful, may not be, but uh, we do see this and that's one of the reasons we um, really support, again, a health-based response that, that doesn't, doesn't approach things from a perspective <coughs> where someone feels like if there's a detection, that's it, you know, they're going to lose their job instantly because that encourages behaviours of people trying to get around things and, um, yeah. Well, so noting that you can't comment on the, the cases, that's the sort of thing that would make sense to you as a drug and alcohol expert, that people would substitute based on a fear of detection? But it's a something that could potentially happen. Uh, it's not... Um, there's, there's a lot of complex evidence around what drives people to use one substance over another yeah. and it's not necessarily a, a clear relationship, but... Yeah, it's not impossible. impossible. The other, um, one of the other issues that has come up a lot in the evidence and I, um, is that some prescription drugs can have an impairing effect, particularly opioids, and we had um, a range of evidence around that, um, uh, but that much of the workplace drug testing or the policies that sit around workplace drug testing often um, accept those consequences because they're based on prescriptions, but the issue is, particularly for medicinal cannabis, that they, it appears that they don't. Do you have any view on the inconsistency between those two approaches? Yeah, absolutely. Be, and and we, that's something we think is a, an enormous issue. And um, we feel the same way about driving. You know, I know this isn't the driving um, inquiry, but it is a similar thing um, where we only test for some substances. And... Um, uh, we know opiates are, can be unbelievably impairing, prescribed or unprescribed, uh, as can benzodiazepines, as can psychiatric medications, um, as can fatigue, as I said earlier. Um, I know there are studies that say, you know, having a poor sleep can be the equivalent level of impairment to having had X, you know, blood alcohol content. So don't uh, have young children is the message. That yes. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. In fact, there's a study that shows having a few children in the back of the car is equivalent to having point something, blood alcohol content. So, you know, impairment's really complicated and it, it speaks to um, the kind of zero tolerance, punitive um, response, you know, detection equals bad equals you're out, um, kind of response to, uh, you know, in this case, medicinal cannabis in the workplace, we don't think is really health-based um, and we'd really like to see that yeah, approached differently. Based on your understanding and knowledge of the testing systems or the testing capability that we have available to us for those industries where it is appropriate or where circumstances um, give rise to employers feeling the need to undertake workplace drug testing. Um, how sophisticated do you think, do you understand the testing systems and regime to be? That's not something I can unfortunately okay. speak to, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. Right there, I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, Rachel? Thank you. And um, thank you, Mr Taylor, for coming and presenting today. I guess um, it, what we've been hearing through the inquiry is that you know, workplace drug testing is implied to create a safer working environment. But what we're hearing from those that do workplace drug testing is that it, it either provides a definitive result or of a positive or a negative. It doesn't really go into further detail about impairment, which you've um, discussed. So um, talking to some of the other experts in this space, they talk about other measures um, first and foremost, and I, and I note that you in your submission talk about some of these pragmatic solutions that may be more practical on the workplace setting, particularly around reducing harm. Would you like to talk us through some of your, um, some of the um, examples that you've discussed in your submission, um, mm. noting that there may be a better approach rather than this, um, a drug test of black and white sort of solution, but rather a holistic approach? Yeah, I think um, probably the, the most, uh, best way to frame it is that I think everybody ultimately, and I know working in the illicit drug space, so there's a lot of disagreement about how to get there, but I think everyone has the same focus, which is everybody wants to minimise harm, right? And I think that's true of this too. You know, we're really concerned with how can we minimise harm in the workplace? Um, and that includes harm to employees um, as well as kind of incidents and so on. So to do that, um, we'd recommend that there's really a suite of health-based responses and a really core part of that is ensuring that an employer has a... Um, you know, evidence-based thorough um, drug and alcohol policy, um, one that is not based on stigma um, towards particular medications or particular drug types, um, and uh, that there's, as I mentioned in my um, opening statement, adequate information. Often people are unaware, and this is something we learned through the trade facts process that I described, people have a poor understanding of substances. Um, one of the key things that um, that process told us was that people in the trades who might have used a substance don't know how long it's staying in their system. So uh, mm. I think if you give people the benefit of the doubt and assume mm. most people actually do want to do the right thing and mm. do want to be safe in the workplace, uh, information can be a really strong way of empowering them to do so. Mm. Um, so ensuring, as I said, there's a strong policy, there's information that's provided to employees and employers, um, ensuring people have access to support um, and information when needed, whether that's referrals to treatment if they need it, whether that's simply about providing information. Um, and as I said earlier, that confidentiality is really respected mm. um, because unfortunately stigma does exist. Unfortunately, stigma does uh, impact on individuals' willingness to disclose their use of medications, <laughs> their conditions that they face. Mm. Um, so ensuring that confidentiality is maintained is mm. very key too. Excellent. And I mean, talking of education, you mentioned trade facts. Do you want to talk to us um, about the uptake of that program and yes, it's been responsive. The response has been yeah, it's been really, um, really well received. Actually, it's um, a great piece of work. Um, it's so uh, as I described, we we were approached and um, and this was identified to us as a piece of need um, within a particular cohort. Um, something the ADF does, in fact, with funding from the Victorian government, is provide information services. So and this is part of that remit. And part of providing information is providing it to cohorts uh, who are at more risk. And we know, for example, young men are at higher risk yeah. of drug harm. Um, so this is about us providing information in the right manner to the right cohort at the right time in the right fashion. Um, and that's something we believe very strongly in, in having targeted approaches. Um, and so that information, it's on a website, it's very accessible. The information is um, presented in a way that's accessible. It's not... Um, buried in, in complex um, sentences. Uh, and very interestingly, uh, one of the key questions that we got a lot was how long, how long do things affect me? How long will mm. this be in my system? Mm. Um, and that may reflect you know, higher use amongst that cohort, but I think it also reflects that people genuinely do want to do the right thing mm -hmm. and do not want to be in a position where they're being unsafe. Yeah. So the, the questioning uh, in, via that um, learning portal or, or that education was around, you know, how much this will affect me, but also how long it will be in my system and, it, and whether it's being impaired, yep. causing impairment. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Dr. Mansfield. Thank you, and thanks for appearing today. Um, I'm interested, we, we heard yesterday from a number of 
um, we, we had various views about the role of um, workplace testing um, that went from everyone should be tested in every workplace um, mm. to, you know, um, I guess views about whether testing was something that was, you know, justified in, in many circumstances at all. Mm. Um, what, uh, as far as you're aware, what role does workplace drug testing have? Um, does, it, does it have a role? What's the evidence for it? We at the ADF uh, work from a kind of primary prevention perspective. That's where most of our work happens. And I think there's pretty strong parallels here in the workplace too, that ultimately I think there are ways to create healthy environments, healthy workforces, uh, where the likelihood of uh, someone impaired, acutely impaired particularly, uh, on the job site is much lower. Um, so I think we would point to, first of all, working upstream, saying what do we have in place in a workplace at a macro level, with, I won't go into kind of employment law and stuff, it's not my space, but you know, do we have the protective factors in place um, for individuals and communities that are going to ensure that we've got people who are healthy, who are coming into work, um, bringing hopefully a healthy best self, when they aren't, that they're able to speak to someone because their workplace has the right settings for them to do that in a way that's confidential, supportive uh, and open. Um, and then it may be the case, you know, in very specific industries with tasks that are particularly safety sensitive, it may be the case that is part of that, you know, setting system. Mm. But we would say that it should not be the only gate, um, you know, uh, again, comparing it to something like drug, drug driving or drink driving, we would argue you need to work upstream of that and you need to ensure that people have transport options to get home from places. You need to ensure that people are aware of the effects of different substances on their driving, um, that there are opportunities to prevent and reduce the risk of harm in the first place. And then that these kind of deterrence factors, punitive deterrence factors, which we know are not necessarily always effective, uh, are only at the very end and a small part of a larger process. And what, I mean, what could be the impact of if you were to say not do some of that upstream work and have testing as kind of your primary um, tool for, I guess, um, if, if you're leaning on that as a safety measure in a workplace? Well, I think you can probably draw a, par a parallel with the way that um, we see illicit drugs being policed in the community, which is by and large, the majority of people using illicit drugs do not come into contact with law enforcement. Mm. Uh, and so law enforcement, has very little deterrent value and the evidence bears that out. It, there's very little deterrence effect to, um, to policing of drug use. And yet then those individuals who are detected and do face consequences face disproportionate consequences for their, um, for being detected, for kind of being unlucky enough in a sense to be detected. And we know that again, looking at it from a prevention perspective, which is where the ADF comes from, we know that employment is a really strong protective factor. We know that employment, meaningful activities, sense of purpose, identity and so on. If someone instantly loses uh, employment as a result of a zero tolerance approach, um, and you know, that may be appropriate in certain settings, I'm not, I'm not saying either way, but um, we know that's a huge, potentially a huge uh, exacerbation of risk factors for that individual if they are in a place where they're at risk of harm. So um, yeah, that would be my response. And with respect to medicinal cannabis, um, you know, because the conversation sort of touched on a broad range of um, alcohol and other drugs, but medicinal cannabis is legal, prescribed medication, you know, um, uh, often prescribed, it's becoming available over the counter and that's creating its own, I guess, um, challenges in this space. Um, but, uh, you know, we've heard stories of different, you know, we, we, through this inquiry, through the submissions, uh, stories of individuals who have had punitive approach applied because THC has been detected as a result of them taking medicinal cannabis prescribed medication. Um, what's your view on how well our, I guess, workplaces are set up to deal with, with this issue? I think the my sense would be not particularly well is is the is the feeling, um, but I think that's this, and I we might have said as much in the submission. But um, I feel like medicinal cannabis has um, forced a lot of thinking uh, around issues that have actually been latent for quite some time. Um, this isn't just about medicinal cannabis. This is about impairment, and this is about the way we treat um, illicit 
drugs or prescribed medications and psychoactive medications. Um, and it's, it's a large issue that goes... Medicinal cannabis has, you know, it stands out for a few reasons because we know that the presence lasts so much longer than um, impairment because we know, and I think because as well, because of the stigma towards cannabis use because it is criminalised um, otherwise, particularly criminalised. Um, and I think it's acted as this kind of lightning rod, um, maybe appropriately to an issue that's been uh, latently sitting there. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. David? Oh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, thank you for your presentations. Really appreciate it. Um, I guess I'd like to sort of move on to some of the sort of practical applications of this. And perhaps if we start with the, uh, the issue you raised about stigma um, and, and a, a person's right to be able to work in, in an environment free of stigma and, and such like. Um, it's not in your submission, but I'm wondering if the Foundation has a view on the applicability of the Discrimination Act and particularly the definition of disability as it applies in this context. Yeah, I'm afraid, sorry, that's just a li little beyond uh, our expertise. So, no, apologies. <laughs> okay. That's a swing and a miss. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, in terms of, of the, the practicalities of, of um, uh, implementing a health-based approach at a, a workplace level, and thinking particularly in terms of you're talking to lawmakers or hopefully you know, shaping that legal process. Are there specific changes you'd like to see to the regulatory framework uh, in terms of the application of um, an appropriate uh, drug and alcohol policy at a workplace level? That's an interesting question and I'm trying to think off the top of my head whether um, there is anything I could give you in concrete terms um, that aligns with our existing positions. A lot of our work um, does focus more on the kind of criminalisation of personal use outside you know, within the community more broadly. I know, I think it's worth saying, you know, we, we support the decriminalisation of, of all personal use and possession of illicit drugs and we know that um, criminalisation is a key driver of stigma, if not the key driver of stigma. Um, I think that's very clear in the way that medicinal cannabis is you know, particularly singled out as a particularly controversial medication when other medications that are more impairing um, that are not criminalised in the same way as cannabis are not stigmatised in the same way. Um, but beyond that, to specific workplace regulations, I'm sorry. Okay. Would you be happy to take that as a... In fact, probably both of my last two swings yep. um, as a question on notice? Yep. OK, that'd be great. Yep. Thank you. We'll um, yep, do what we can. All right. <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, the importance of, of education, um, and, and, and again, this, this, this link back to, to prevention, um, outside of the workplace setting or in the, in the context of preparing people for work and, and for re-entering work, I mean, would you have some thoughts on what's currently provided by way of that education and what's missing? Do you mean in terms of someone going through, say, a workers' comp process, returning to work? Is that? Oh, that might be one, or it might just be new new work entrance. Entering the workforce. Uh, I'm just sort of wondering your the foundation's thoughts on on to what degree are people actually educated about some of these issues before they get to the workplace? I think that's a, a great point, and I think overall we would say that um, what you might call drug literacy in, in the community isn't as high as it could be. Unfortunately, again, stigma has really influenced the way in which. Um, drugs are spoken about in the community, uh, particularly in school settings. Um, often um, we've done a little bit of a review of the research around um, drug education in schools and often it looks like, uh, you know, they'll bring in someone who was a kind of, I used X drug and look what happened and it'll be a once-off session um, and it'll be designed to scare the kids and it'll be a real, you know, the typical just say no um, thing. And, the evidence tells us quite clearly that does not work um, and in fact in some cases can uh, even exacerbate issues. It can make uh, drug use look dangerous, interesting, um, all the things that children or young people are drawn to. Um, so instead we've, we've always advocated for um, evidence-based, non-stigmatising um, information to be provided to the right cohorts, as I said earlier, the right cohorts in the right manner at the right time 
So having targeted education, particularly at high risk groups. So the TradeVax um, project is a really strong example of that, where we have a particularly high risk group. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've worked with that group to design something that is meaningful to them. And so we, we would probably say that having information that's couched in the right terms um, for those cohorts is really important. I won't try and open another one just at this okay. stage. Yeah. Ten seconds to go. I might come back at this okay. time. Um, Lee, are you online, Lee? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my questions have been asked, so I'm happy to cede my time to others who still have some questions remaining. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr Heath? Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for your presentation. I've just got a couple of questions. How do you, um, and they might be similar, so it could be like, as Mr. Edishank would say, swinging a myth. But what's a good example of some upstream work, upstream work that you have seen in the area of workplace drug and alcohol practices? That's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think there's when we talk about uh, prevention, um, we try and approach prevention from a systemic perspective, and that means working at multiple levels. So working at an uh, individual level, um, how can we ensure that individuals have the right protective factors in place or their risk factors minimised, uh, ensuring that communities around individuals are strong and also that the regulatory settings are right. So there are these different levels that we can work at in prevention. So in terms of working upstream um, in the workplace, that might be everything from ensuring that young people coming through uh, education are being provided with the right edu uh, education about the potential impacts of impairment, um, whatever the causes may be, um, their rights, their obligations, and so on in that regard. Um, so that's information provision. Um, there are broader social factors that go to general community wellbeing, um, ensuring that you have a healthy workforce, um, but that goes to much broader social determinants of health. Um, and then I think some of the questions you're here to answer as a committee as well in terms of the regulatory settings are important in helping minimise uh, and prevent harm. Yeah, um, thank you. And more downstream, have you seen an example of where testing or in terms of either drug testing or impairment testing has worked well and has been implemented in a supportive way in a workplace? I'm sorry, I'm probably not familiar enough with the space to point to specific yeah. examples. Um, it, it may be the case that it is, but um, yeah, sorry, couldn't talk to it specifically. That's okay. And um, what about you? You have spoken quite a bit about um, stigma and, you know, how often when we talk about drugs, it's stigmatised. How, how should we talk, be talking about drugs? We, there's actually quite a parallel with the, um, the change. If you think about drug education schools, for example, um, the parallel with sex education that's kind of um, occurred, the change in the way that we talk about you know, sex education in school is um, an interesting parallel where it's um, previously been quite a taboo, stigmatised topic, whereas now the curriculum's designed in a way um, that is meant to provide age-appropriate information um, about a topic that is relevant to all people, um, you know, uh, in the right ways at the right time. So we'd say in a similar way that this, um, we should talk about drugs in a way that is non-stigmatising, that's evidence-based, um, that is generally neutral, um, so on our website. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not in that space, what's an example of that, if that's all right? Because, like, I, I sure. understand sort of the big picture that we don't want it to be stigmatising, but what's an example of that, like talking about a specific drug to okay. a specific age group? Yeah, a great example is recently we um, gave evidence to Parliament around um, the vaping inquiry recently. And so young people, for example, find when... They're told constantly that vaping's bad, it's going to hurt your lungs, it's going to hurt your brain, all these things, and that they're constantly being told the negatives while they're out experiencing potentially positive effects of vaping, fitting in, having fun, um, and so on. That can be really discordant, it doesn't resonate. Um, so, for example, just as an example for you, um, speaking about the positive effects that some people might perceive around a substance is an important way of talking about things in an evidence-based way. Is talking about the positive effects of drugs, though, normalising it in an unhealthy way? Um, I understand the question, um, but in our perspective, no. And in fact, we find almost the opposite. It's when um, information is provided that does not resonate with people, that people see and think, 
this isn't true. My friends have used X drug and haven't had terrible things happen to them, despite what this person's telling me. Um, they don't engage at all. Whereas if they're presented with information that says, hey, someone might use this because of these particular reasons, there are these effects though, um, and this is what you should think about if you want to be safe, that can be much more engaging. Yeah. What do you think um, drug use is healthy? Uh, I think uh, there's risks to lots of different behaviours. Yep. Yeah, we'd say there's, there's no level of um, use of anything that's not risky, alcohol included. So you'd say drug use is no different to alcohol use? Yeah, in the sense that they are psychoactive substances, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. I'm just seeing if I've got any others. Um, um, do you want us to come, come uh, back to you? Or? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. sorry. What, am I still within my time? I think the time's up. Uh, I'll come back to you oh. if you've got more time. Think, um, just one. Um, it's, Mr Taylor, your submission talks a bit about... Um, testing and impairment testing generally um, because it's well sort of relevant to where this committee is considering matters how how effective are current tests for impairment um, and how far do we need to go do you think before we get something that's usable in terms of general impairment beyond yeah presence of well this is the question yes how yeah. do we how do we test for impairment in a very broad sense um, and uh, beyond, yeah, simply the presence of particular yeah. drugs in the bloodstream. And to that, I think the answer is unfortunately a long way. Um, I think there will be, I know some cars these days track your eyes to see if you're falling asleep, but um, I think in terms of technological silver bullet, I think it's a, not something that's on the horizon, which is why I think we can't look to testing as a silver bullet in general. Uh, and I think it needs to be an upstream process where we're working to create healthier environments in the first place to minimise the risk and that testing for impairment or presence is a kind of last step in a process if it needs to be in place. Um, David, you had some questions you wanted to ask? You. Um, no, you go. You have, you have, uh, no, You're good? Okay. I can go back to... Um, yeah, so I guess what we're hearing throughout this submission is that, you know, a, a patient is being prescribed medicinal cannabis, they've got a working, they've had a, a working agreement with their doctor as to how that prescription is fulfilled, um, how they take their medication, and then when they're disclosing it to their workplace, this is where they're finding a zero tolerance approach. It may not even be through a test. Yep. It may even be just through disclosure. Um, you mentioned in your submission that there's been, an, obviously there's an uptake in medicinal cannabis um, prescriptions, and we're seeing that, you know, in my eyes, that's because it, wor it works and that's why people are accessing it. But in your in experience with um, harm minimisation, are we also seeing this uptake because people are more inclined to access medicinal cannabis because they feel it's safer than other medications that they may have been previously accessing? That's an interesting question. Mm. Um, I don't know if I could speak to that from an evidence-based perspective. Okay. I'm sorry, I just don't... Yeah, have that to mm. top of mind. Yeah, I could take it on notice if you like. Do you want to just talk about what you what you've uh, monitored with the uptake in medicinal cannabis prescriptions? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. In general, I think um, it's probably no surprise to the committee that um, yes, the number of cannabis medicinal cannabis prescriptions has increased dramatically mm -hmm. in the last five years. I think um, the curve looks like this, and it's only going up. Um, this is. I was looking at the stats yesterday, and what's quite interesting is we know that the proportion of Australians who use medicinal or cannabis for medicinal purposes, sorry, is about 3% of, of Australians do so. Mm. Um, and that of that, the proportion of those people who use cannabis for medicinal purposes has, um, who have accessing it via script has increased dramatically from um, our data point in 2019 to our most recent data point in 2022, 23. Um, now we're seeing a really significant proportion, I think about a third of people using um, cannabis for medicinal purposes, accessing it via a script. So about 1% of the or maybe a little bit less population. So it is quite a significant change. And it's important to note too that the number of people using cannabis overall in the population has not changed between mm. those data points. So yeah. this is more so that, yeah, a, a cohort who were already using for medicinal purposes are now accessing via a legitimate pathway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> uh, oh, Dr. Heath, a bit of time. You uh, had some questions still? 
remember what my question was. Why do you think medical cannabis is stigmatised? Um, we generally <laughs> see stigmatisation where drugs are criminalised. And even though um, medicinal cannabis is now available medicinally, um, we're seeing still cannabis use more generally um, criminalised. And so we see criminalisation as probably the key driver of stigma uh, towards particular substance and substance users. I would say it is probably softening um, the stigma towards medicinal cannabis and cannabis and is probably, uh, in terms of different drugs in the community, not as strong as some of the stigma towards other substances, but we'd say it's still there and still affecting people's outcomes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chair. That was all my questions. Thank you. Um, is the committee anyone else? No, we're all good. Let's just ask the question, uh, Robert, is there, are there any other issues that uh, you'd like to just bring to the attention of the committee before we close up? Thank you for that offer. I think, um, no, stigma was something I really did want to bring up and I think we've spoken about that quite a bit, so I okay. appreciate that. Okay. Well, thank, Rob, thank, thank you so much for coming in. Um, I just have one question. The place where you hear this inquiry on um, workplace testing, and we should, overall, I think we all heard based into the approach of um, the health aspect, I think we understand that. Just for lesson, you're the Alcohol and Drug Foundation position in relation to prescription medications, mm. including cannabis. Should they be in the same category as illicit drug, who, those who are, are using other drugs are having issues, we understand we've got, we have to have a uh, health approach to them. But should all these people who are prescribed from doctors and are not addicted in a way, but that they're actually trying to treat their own um, whatever disadvantage they're having, medical wise or health wise, should they be subject to the same as those who are under illicit drug for whatever purpose, recreation, and are going through the rehab? Phase, which we should be supporting, but should these people who are already seeking doctors and go and prescribe and they test positive, should be categorised the same or should they just be all, all in the past, past category and say you, you've been prescribed, you see the doctor, you're fine, even though you, you've been post positive? I think my, my response to that would be that we ultimately, as I said before, I think everyone's concern is ultimately with minimising harm yep. and creating, in this case, safe workplaces. And from that perspective, whether it's Valium that's prescribed or whether it's cannabis that's unprescribed, um, I think the question remains the same, which is how do we create safety? And um, so I think impairment should be treated the same within a workplace setting. Yep. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I think we'll thank you much for your, for your coming in and submission you. and your members. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll hand start to stop.